The remarkable works of Canadian inventor John Hutchison has drawn widespread attention from businessmen and government scientists since 1979. He began using ultra-high electromagnetic frequencies to transform matter in some very unusual ways. It has come to be known as the Hutchison effect. This is real dustification you're gonna see here. Now if that thing tipped over, it, it would take out a few blocks worth of buildings. It turns to dust. Malcolm Bendel, an inventor with a background in geochemistry, demonstrates his groundbreaking thunderstorm generator to a room full of people in Zurich, Switzerland. You have a positive and negative end, north power, south pole, two tornadoes colliding in the middle. Thunderstorm in a bottle. Electronics engineer and inventor Joe Parr conducted experiments on the top of the Great Pyramid. discovered yet another strange physical phenomenon. The model pyramid became weightless in the energy field. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. I figured out how to go in front of the map. This, the whole topic today is about the number nine. The most great name of God equals number nine in the Baha'i scriptures. This energy is the only thing that comes from the whole, from zero, the vortex. It goes out linearly in all directions. Pacific Ocean, about 2,000 miles from the U.S. mainland. Marco Roden, a young man growing up in Hawaii, with an innate understanding of the world around him, struggled to fit in at school because he understood everything a little too well. His dad owned a hotel chain and Marco managed a part of the property which got by on its own, giving Marco time to explore and experience the world. He was an enthusiastic reader of various ancient texts, It wasn't until he had a psychedelic experience with acid that he stumbled upon the secrets of the universe. What did Marco see? Vortex-based mathematics. In an instant moment of intense clarity that one can only describe as a direct download to the brain, he had tapped into knowledge of a previously unknown field of energy, and his visions were so clear that he could map this field of energy out mathematically. Ever just know something, Dr. Nash? Constantly. Instantly realizing the significance, Marco sat down and started decoding the Baha'i scriptures using this realization, and then developed the foundations of vortex-based math. A new way of not just understanding the world, but applying that understanding into a comprehensive theory of math that explains numbers as physical vectors in space-time, instead of random appropriations. This means that the numbers are stationary and don't change. Unlike traditional math, where the numbers change, in VBM the numbers are constant, and the functions themselves represent the changing variables. When you think about it, this makes more sense. Functions themselves represent the changing variables in space-time, not numbers. Marco put the work out there to all sorts of researchers, and a few highly credible scientists like Russell Blake took him very seriously. Russell assisted Marco to significantly expand his work. While mapping vortex math onto a toroid, they had realized Marco stumbled upon a perfect 3D system of math, one that is completely different to the linear math everyone already studies. Realizing the errors in the way we traditionally do math, Marco began to understand why linear math leads to irrational numbers such as pi. With his groundbreaking discovery, you can solve problems involving the length of curves without using pi. To understand, we must first ask the question, why is pi an irrational number in the first place? 
pi is used to represent a constant ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. But this linear way of arithmetic ignores one simple fact. Nothing in the universe moves in a straight line. Everything moves on an angle. In one-dimensional space, this represents a curve. Two dimensions represents a spiral. Three a vortex. When we map out pi on a circle with traditional math, we are assuming the circle is occupying a linear two-dimensional space. However, this is the mistake. Since nothing in the universe is a straight line, we are essentially measuring a spiral as a straight line creating an endless string of irrational digits to rectify the solution. This is the real reason why pi is an irrational number. In vortex math, there are no irrational numbers, Somewhere in the Indian Ocean, after seven years of isolation on a remote island working on an engine that could change the world, inventor Malcolm Bendel gets ready to journey to the United States for the first time in almost a decade. Due to the pressure to protect his reputation, when Randall Carlson inadvertently outs him on the Joe Rogan podcast. The other thing is, is when we talk about these ancient technologies, if we're only looking for a mere reflection of ourselves, we could overlook it completely because there is, I think there's evidence that exists now. I mean, modern, some modern researchers whose work has been buried or suppressed, I think we're getting very close to rediscovering some of the things that um, our ancient ancestors were up to. And maybe this would be worth a whole show in itself. Well, what kind of technologies are you talking about? There are people out there now who have been working on trying to rediscover that. And there are people who've been working on these things for, for decades now, basically in secret. And I've had the privilege of talking to some of these people over the last six or seven years. And right now, as we're speaking, there's a, there's a group of people who are basically going to open source a whole lot of stuff in the next three months. So it can never get suppressed again. And that's why I'd like to come back and talk in more detail. Well, I'd detail love to have it. you come back and talk about it. Malcolm Bendel, a scientist with a background in geochemistry, has been developing a comprehensive theory of the universe for several years. The plasmoid unification model, a unified field theory that calculates the resonant frequencies of everything in the universe. However, while on the Joe Rogan podcast, the producer had pulled up information regarding a smear campaign against Malcolm, a smear campaign about his spiritual and religious beliefs, a logical fallacy known as the ad hominem fallacy, one where Joe apparently attacked Bendel's character instead of his scientific claims. Some of this information may have related to stories from The Shaman, an interesting book from author Roland Perry that is loosely based off of Malcolm's life. In this book, it is said that a scientist named Holt, who is based on Malcolm, was once a leading pastor and director of a fundamentalist church with Pentecostal roots, the full gospel businessmen's international. In The Shaman Perry writes that the scientist had helped persuade a woman in a coma to not join her ancestors and come back from the light. I ministered to the dead in an outside the cafe where Martin Bryant murdered 35 people. One of the victims was in a coma for five days. The state governor wanted me to have a look at her. I sat with the woman in hospital for five hours. I persuaded her not to go into the light. Wait, do you mean die? She had terrible gunshot injuries. Her son had gone over. She wished to be with him. I talked her out of it. Cavalier was silent for a moment. I did that with your daughter. She was making her way to the spirits of relatives when I talked her back. Cavalier felt a chill up his spine when she made a baffling and astonishing recovery, doctors were left dumbfounded. Let's remind ourselves that ideology and beliefs can change over a person's lifetime. If we were all judged based on past decisions, nobody would come out looking good. That being said, these remarkable claims are not without scientific basis. The awareness during resuscitation study, which involved 2,060 patients from 15 hospitals in the US, UK, and Austria, is the largest study to date on out-of-body and near-death experiences. Researchers tested the validity of conscious experiences using objective markers for the first time in a large study to determine whether claims of awareness that corresponded with out-of-body experiences aligned with real, 
rather than hallucinatory events. The research found that the themes around the experience of death were far broader than previously understood, and that experiences such as these have a scientific basis. Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid unification model is a theory that explains the nature of the universe and the interactions between particles. The model proposes that the universe is made of energetic plasma-like structures called plasmoids that can take on different forms and properties depending on their state and environment. These plasmoids interact with each other through a complex web of electromagnetic forces, which Bendel argues are responsible for all the phenomena we observe in the cosmos. From the behavior of subatomic particles to the motion of galaxies. According to Bendel, the plasmoid unification model provides a more coherent and comprehensive framework for understanding the universe than traditional models based on matter and energy alone. It has the potential to revolutionize our understanding of physics and cosmology. The mysterious and awe-inspiring universe may finally be revealed by this groundbreaking plasmoid unification model which suggests that the very fabric of reality is made up of energetic and quasi-stable plasma-like structures that interact with each other through electromagnetic forces, providing an all-encompassing, coherent, and revolutionary explanation for the behavior of particles from the smallest subatomic levels to the vast reaches of our galaxy, potentially unifying gravity with the other fundamental forces of nature. From colors, shapes, elements, and even polarized cardinal directions. Malcolm discovered that all elements are plasmoids. Plasmoids are self-contained torus-shaped bits of matter in the fourth state, a state of matter some theorize to be a gateway to zero-point energy, zero-point energy, or quantum zero-point fluctuations in the vacuum, is the energy that is proven to exist through math. It is the energy that exists at any system's zero-point. When all other energy has been frozen out of an atom, electron spin still does not decay. Where does that energy come from? Fluctuations in the vacuum Richard Feynman was a renowned American theoretical physicist who made significant contributions to the development of quantum electrodynamics. Feynman once famously said, one teacup of empty space contains enough energy to boil all the world's oceans. So if the universe contains all this free energy, where is it and how do we access it? That's exactly the question inventors like Malcolm would ask. His comprehensive unification model isn't just theoretical. Bendel successfully applied his theory to a practical working prototype. This prototype can be retrofit on any gas or diesel engine, not only doubling efficiency, but eliminating toxic and harmful greenhouse emissions in the process. This process of cold fusion, which had been suppressed in the replication of the pons fleischmann experiment, produces tiny plasmoid clusters that have the potential to release enormous amounts of energy. They were kind of forced into this position by uh, a guy called Stephen E. Jones, who was brought in uh, to kind of verify what they were seeming to find uh, by the Department of Energy, um, whether they were actually seeing what they were claiming, which was uh, he kind of gave the name to it called Cold Fusion, although Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons really didn't like the idea of that, that phrase being used. They were very uncomfortable with it because they didn't really know what it was at the time. Uh, and then various people were brought in by uh, George Bush Sr. to kind of give a six-month crash, can we replicate this? And this very famous story uh, at MIT, they they, they doctored their data to remove their own findings um, uh, to try and uh, paint the fact that cold fusion is dead. And he blew the whistle. Uh, I inadvertently was looking through some piles of paper that had been given to me in a casual manner by all these hot fusion physicists as they were trying to do their calorimetric uh, repeat of the Pons Fleischmann experiment. And to my utter astonishment, I can remember sitting at my desk in my study and actually seeing these two sheets of paper, the one dated July 10th, 1989, and another dated July 13th, three days apart. The difference between July 10th and 13th was dramatic. And I was stunned. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It looked like monkey business to me at the time, and it has turned out to be exactly that. It was a lower echelon person in the Plasma Fusion Center at MIT, one of the 16 authors of a scientific paper done under Department of Energy contract that had altered data. 
and that data is scientific fraud. It is estimated that up to one kilowatt of power can be released from these charge clusters when they reach their full charge density. The late Ken Shoulders had already proven this and filed a patent for this technology because it had the ability to do something remarkable. These charged clusters, when radioactive isotopes were introduced, would atomically reconfigure or disassociate these isotopes into non-radioactive isotopes. Essentially what this does is scrub clean radioactive waste into harmless versions of the element. However, shadowy figures from the Department of Energy demanded the grant be removed. Why would anyone want to suppress this world-changing technology? As it turns out, the reason was that these clusters were accessing the quantum fluctuations in the vacuum. They were successfully channeling zero-point energy. So, just what are plasmoids? Seth Putterman called it the star in a jar. Microscopic ball lightning in the shape of a self-contained imploded sphere. These plasma spheres take on the shape of a torus due to the fact that they collapse in on themselves symmetrically. Plasmoids are found in nature. They are everywhere. These quasi-stable clusters are what give thunderstorms and cyclones their enormous power. These same processes for channeling and utilizing plasmoid energy are replicated in the thunderstorm and plasmoid generators, where counter-rotating vortexes collide at specific angles within multiple spheres of specific ratios. In the quantum physics is your event horizon. What it does, you have a positive and negative end, a north power, south pole, two tornadoes colliding in the middle. These angles and dimensions Bendel utilizes are not only found in nature, they have been written about in various ancient texts and encoded within ancient architecture for thousands of years. This ancient knowledge can be seen in the Great Pyramids. For example, the angle at which these vortexes must collide to successfully discharge is the same exact angle that is used for the concave on the pyramid wall. It has been theorized by many that the pyramids were used to generate power. Ben Van Kirkwick and Graham Hancock have talked about Egyptian culture being misstated and misunderstood, with two separate dynasties and cultures separated by not only great distances in time, but vast differences in technological achievement. The technological contradiction extends also to architecture. Let's consider the pyramids. There are quite clearly two classes of pyramids that can be found in ancient Egypt. On the left, we have the massively megalithic stone pyramids made up of huge blocks of stone. And on the right, we have the other pyramids that are all over Egypt. They're made from mud bricks and many of them are decaying slowly over the years and they're starting to fall apart versus, you know, the stone pyramids are still standing and mostly intact. Then we have Christopher Dunn, an engineer who wrote a book on how this energy could have been harnessed and makes an astonishing connection to Tesla in his upcoming book. And I came to the conclusion that those granite beams, they had to have actually tuned them to respond to a particular frequency. And really, just like piano strings, if you have strike one and you undampen the strings, another one at a higher octave will, will resonate. The harmonic of that particular frequency will resonate. It will absorb the energy and respond in sympathy with it. And you can actually transfer energy from this lowest beam clear to the top beam. If each of those beams is tuned to the same frequency or a harmonic of that frequency, and that is what I believe is, hap is happening. It is curious that Tesla once thought the pyramids were also power generators of some sort. Perhaps he even based his Wardenclyffe Tower off this theory of capturing the resonant vibration of the Earth and amplifying it within the King's Chamber. The King's Chamber is a room within the Great Pyramid that has a suspicious hollowed-out cavity surrounding it, making it a perfect candidate for a resonant chamber this setup can create a resonant cavity that amplifies specific sound frequencies. By altering the size and shape of the chamber and cavity, different frequencies or pitches can be amplified. However, the level and quality of the resonance created would depend on various factors such as the materials used and the shape and size of the chambers. This means that the builders had to know the precise dimensions of this cavity before building it. 
and what do engineers say about precision? Precision is not without function. If we look at architecture and technology, the only time we need precision is when a specific function is required. And what do we see all around these ancient megaliths? From the precisely cut and quarried massive stones, to extremely symmetrical and polished pottery, made with stone that is near diamond strength. We see evidence of purpose and function everywhere. But archaeologists have yet to find any human remains or authentic grave markers within the structure. The design of the tunnel system and the chamber rooms within the Great Pyramid have convinced engineering expert Chris Dunn that the true purpose of the massive structure was to act as a power plant distributing energy through obelisks. The Great Pyramid at Giza covers 13 acres. It's a very remarkable building. The precision of this building uh, exceeds anything that we require of builders today. For instance, the area over 13 acres was leveled within 7 eighths of an inch. That's about the thickness of a thumbnail. The casing stones are joined line to line to within 10 thousandths of an inch and the joints are filled with some kind of mysterious cement that nobody's been able to figure out what the formula is. This is not the work of the primitive people who have copper chisels. We're taught in school that the Great Pyramid is a tomb, but if you look at the complexity of these buildings, the precision with which they were built, the features that you see on the inside, these various shafts and passageways. For me, it looks like a machine. With more than 50 years of experience in the aerospace industry, Dunn believes that chemical reactions took place within the Great Pyramid that generated electromagnetic waves. You have two shafts leading into the Queen's Chamber and these shafts delivered the chemicals to the chamber that they would mix and boil off hydrogen and then the hydrogen would pass through another passageway to the Grand Gallery and then into the King's Chambers. Dunn speculates that once the hydrogen gas reached the King's Chamber, vibrations energized and converted the hydrogen atoms into microwaves. You have evidence to support the theory that hydrogen was being fed down the northern shaft, which leads to the king's chamber, and then it enters the chamber and collects the energy that has accumulated in that chamber, and then directs it through the southern shaft for the microwaves to spread out. So that energy uh, would reach large distances. And I think if you had an obelisk at any distance, it could actually affect that particular structure. So you have microwave amplification through stimulated emission radiation. That's the acronym. Knowing a bit about how the thunderstorm engine utilizes specific angles, maybe these pyramids were directing natural airstreams filled with these naturally occurring plasmoid clusters that are more abundant in the air due to an ionization process. We also know that there are unexplained chambers in the pyramid that lead from the outside toward the inner structure. Chambers that don't make any logical sense and have no explainable purpose. Perhaps these chambers capture these energy clusters and redirect them inward to collide at specific angles to generate massive amounts of energy. Whatever the reason for the Great Pyramids, one thing is for certain. These new discoveries are worthy of their own episode I'm about to show you the mind-blowing mathematical lens. That is vortex-based math. Let's lay a couple of ground rules. First of all, in vortex math, we don't use zero. VBM is all about doubling and then reducing numbers down to a single digit. If you can bear with the arithmetic for a minute, I can teach you the significance of three, six, and nine, a mystery that has eluded scientists and engineers for decades. We begin by doubling one to get two. We then double again to get four and then again to get eight. Now what does eight double get us? Remember, 
we reduce the double digit down to a single digit by adding the two base components, and we are back to 7. 7 doubled gets you 14 which reduces back to 5. Doubling 5 we get 10 which reduces back to 1. Notice the infinity symbol created. This isn't a random design. The angles and paralleled lines in this diagram all reflect intricately woven relationships that are baked into the fabric of our reality. That is because numbers aren't just utilities for measuring. Numbers actually represent physical vectors in space-time, ones in which the fractals of creation are based on. In that sense, numbers are real. As you can see, numbers reveal the underlying pattern of creation. And everywhere we look, we can see this fingerprint of God. These numbers that form the infinity symbol represent our physical reality and how it interacts with itself. And if numbers represent physical vectors in space, then they must also have properties that can be observed. Let's look a little closer into this. 9 is a significant number because it was discovered by Marco that the number 9 gives the other numbers polarity. If 1, 2, 4, 8, 7 and 5 represent our physical reality, then 3, 6, and 9 must represent this previously unknown form of energy, a magnetic flux field at the quantum level, the zero point. These numbers are what form our physical reality. This quantum flux field is the source for the non-decaying spin of an electron, the infinite well of radiant energy our universe runs itself on. Pushing this theory further, Marco theorized that everything in the universe is a vortex, from DNA to black holes. It is nature's path of least resistance. This energy permeates everything and will penetrate any material. This leads to everything in the universe being non-linear, not even time. Because the higher dimensions of our brain think linearly to organize our lives in a coherent manner, we perceive time to be linear. So how do we map out this flux field of energy emanating from the physical vector 9? And how do we even know this energy emanates from 9 and gives the other numbers polarity? Remember those patterns I talked about, the ones baked into the fabric of our reality? With this polarity, a mirroring effect happens. In the diagram, we can see every number on one side will correspond to the other side in an equal but opposing way. By doing some simple arithmetic, we can prove undoubtedly that these numbers, these physical vectors in space, all relate to one another in a coherent and intelligent manner. We begin by doubling 9. Vortex math is primarily about doubling and dividing, reflecting the natural processes for creation. Doubling 9 gives us 18. Adding the two digits gives us 9. We do this again. 18 plus 18 equals 36. Adding these together also gives us 9. It doesn't matter how many times we double this vector, 9 will always double to equal itself. This is the mathematical representation of this zero-point energy's emanation. Let's move on to the number 3. Doubling 3 gives us 6. Doubling 6 gives us 12, which brings us back to 3. Again, we double 12 to get 24. Adding these numbers brings us back to 6. This pattern of back and forth will continue indefinitely, like the pendulum effect of a magnetic flux field. It doesn't matter how many times you double these numbers, they will always oscillate back and forth with the energy that is emanating from the ninth vector. These are the only numbers that do this. It is because this is how vibration and motion occurs. Energy is always in motion and cannot be destroyed. It is the reason our universe is constantly in motion, but never actually going anywhere. An infinity, not in direction but in motion. The number 9 is the source of this energy. It is the only energy that exists at any system's zero point. Therefore, it is the highest form of energy in our universe. This is the source of energy Marco is describing, what he saw in his vision, ancient knowledge lost in time. If you take a look at the layout of Washington, there is a clear pattern that reflects the Masonic symbol. Some historians believe that the triangle found in the center of Washington, D.C., represents the Masonic symbol of the square and compass. This makes sense when most of the founding fathers were Freemasons. However, if you make the connection to vortex math and look closely at where the Washington Monument is located, where the zero is, this is the zero point, the point where Marco Roden theorized cosmic energy radiates out of. 
These monoliths are made out of granite, and there's some quartz inside the granite, and quartz has some rather interesting properties, like the piezoelectric effect. If I take quartz crystal and I squeeze it, I can generate electricity. Now, some people believe that the obelisks are like lightning rods that absorb electrical energy from the heavens. Could the Egyptian obelisks have been designed to attract energy? In addition to the conductivity of quartz stone, it has been found that when the obelisks were first erected, they were capped with a naturally occurring metal alloy called electrum. We know that they were covered or capped in many cases with electrum, which is a combination of gold and silver, and they may have been meant to attract plasma, electrically charged particles. Is this new connection to mysticism and symbolism, the smoking gun regarding obelisks being transmitters or receivers of some kind of radiant energy? Whether the connection is metaphorical or practical, these new connections could finally lead us to answer the age-old question, just who are the Freemasons in the larger picture of history? Instead of using the conventional approach of mapping VBM to a hypercube, Rodin adopted a unique method of mapping his mathematics onto the surface of a hypersphere. While a hypersphere and a toroid are distinct shapes, it is possible to visually represent a four-dimensional hypersphere in three-dimensional space using a toroidal shape through a technique called stereographic projection. This is stereographic projection. This is a sculpture that illustrates stereographic projection. Stereographic projection is a map from the sphere to the plane. And the way that it works is you look at the north pole of the sphere and you draw straight lines from the north pole down onto the plane. And if you arrange the light at the north pole, then uh, the light rays uh, effectively do stereographic projection. And these curves on the sphere are mapped to the straight line grid on the plane. This allows for a 3D visualization of the hypersphere's properties and is commonly used in mathematics and physics. In mainstream mathematics and computer science, higher dimensional objects are often mapped onto hypercubes or other geometric shapes to facilitate visualization. However, Rodin's approach was unique in that he utilized a method of mapping his mathematics onto the surface of a hypersphere rather than a hypercube allowing for a more intuitive representation of the underlying geometry, the geometry of the universe itself. And this shape here is called, yes, we know it's a donut, but in science they don't call it that. Taurus, T-O-R-U-S, or Tori means multiple Tauruses. Our body was named after it. What's our body called? A toroid, human torso, T-O-R-S-O. You know what that means? It means you're getting put through the grinder because that hole is a tor. It means it's a hole. And it means that everything is either imploding into that hole or exploding after, out the other side. And if you don't have that hole, you're toast. Because it's always in and out. Compression, decompression. Implosion, explosion. And it's doing something else. It's thermal. It's about heat dissipation, which is the very foundation of all physics and astrophysics because this is modeling a black hole and nothing goes through the hole in the center or the hole wouldn't exist see this red line spirals and defines the hole by being an aperture like our eye because there's something i believe emanating in this hole that's causing this hole to not close okay and that's what i'm harnessing that's what I found. In Rodin's sequence, 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, and 5, each number is related to the previous one in a cyclical fashion. In a hologram, the hole is in the part, the part's in the hole. It doesn't matter which you take image in this explanation. I'm laughing because I'm thinking how extraordinary it is what you're seeing there. There's no words to describe the miracle of putting those numbers into place and seeing the donut from different perspectives. You have no idea how big of a deal this is. The sequence has a fractal-like structure with self-similarity, meaning that if you zoom in or out on the pattern, it will always look the same. By using this cyclical property, it's possible to design technology in a way that takes advantage of the repeating pattern to achieve greater performance 
without adding more resources. The Mobius circuit, the superfluid preferred longest mean free pathway of least resistance for electrical superconductivity always follows this bounded infinity circuit. You start with one, one God, one universe. It doubles, becomes two. That's Gabriel's trumpet, four, because the B is not a bilivial stop. It's a plosive. So when I say the most great name of God, I don't say, which is the Baha, means glory in Arabic, Aramaic. It's a loan word out of Arabic to the Farsi language. It's in the Bible, it's in the Torah, it's in the Quran, it's in Buddhism, it's in everything. And the superlative case of Baha, which is the higher case, the highest is called Abha. And that represents, that translates to splendor, wondrous, or glory. That's the heavenly world. And I had to learn all this math to help me understand that. So what happens is one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, but I'm back to where I began. So why is the I Ching 64? Why is it the $64,000 question? Not because eight times eight is 64. We thought it was. Why? It's because it's one complete cycle of infinity. And it's not infinity of a straight line direction, it's infinity of a spin continuum. It's infinity of duration. So 64 doubles is 128, but one plus two plus eight equals 11 is two. 256 equals 13 is four. 512 equals eight. 1024 equals seven. 2048 equals 14 is five. There's only six numbers in infinity before it repeats. So infinity isn't infinite. It's a bounded infinity, like the electron orbital. That's a big deal. I'm taking the binary code, which is doubling, and I'm saying I can turn conventional computers, I'm taking this back to how to make a supercomputer, and I can take that binary code and I can say, I'm not interested in how, uh, on the, how many transistors I can pack into the smallest processor I can make. I'm interested in cycling. How many times I go around, I'm interested in making a track for computer logic processors. Everybody today, we're making computers that are using the binary code. Nobody knows how to use the 396693 to do calculations yet in a supercomputer. No one knows that you can't have the binary code without the 396693. I'm telling every computer scientist that you don't even have the whole picture yet. That's unbelievable. That there's another pattern, number pattern, in calculating that is indispensable to these calculations, which is the 396. So if I go from three, because we know if I go one, two, four, eight, seven, five, I'm going to go back to one. You can't leave the train track. You're on a rail. But what happens with this? Bear in mind, why is it a dotted line? Because I'm trying to convey to you that it's a higher dimensional flux field. Because every coil, as I had to learn, you're now having to learn, as it was taught to me by Scott, who was my mechanical engineer, chief, every coil has an associated magnetic field with it, except it's not just magnetism, it's spirit and magnetism. The field is magnetism, the flux is spirit. It's a flux field. So. Spirit is irresistible, penetrates everything, and is the source of all motion, vibration, and time. I have found a numerical formula for spirit. I know when and where spirit is in 3D space, and more importantly, I know where it's not. Okay, so spirit has a phasing. It has an activation sequence. It has a timing. And there's a numerical formula for it. So what am I doing? I'm getting rid of calculus. I'm getting rid of equations. Or I'm giving them numerical equivalents because calculus is never any better than the person speaking it. Whereas numbers are a part of our world. They're a part of creation. They have attributes, they have physical properties, and they have a timing. The relationship to geometry or to tiles or to tempo and timing is an inherent part of this discovery. So spirit is also called prana, Chi, tachyon, monopole, dark energy, dark matter. It's also called uh, soliton, Higgins, God particle. It's what everybody wants right now. It's what the big race is that everybody's looking for. I've elected to use the term they use in the scriptures, which is spirit. I could easily substitute any other name for it. This opens up new possibilities for creating technologies that are more energy efficient, smaller and faster, potentially making current technologies obsolete the traditional linear approach in engineering is based on the concept of adding more resources, such as more transistors or more power, to increase the speed and capacity of a system. However, the cyclical approach in vortex math is different. 
Rather than adding more resources, this approach focuses on increasing the efficiency of a system by exploiting its inherent cyclical patterns. By utilizing engineering in this fashion, you are choosing the path of least resistance for both the programming language and electrons flowing through the hardware. Marco believes that the energy flow in the universe is a result of a continuous geometric progression that starts from the singularity at zero and expands outward in a spiral motion. Following a specific pattern called the Roden coil, in vortex math, the number 9 is considered to be a very special number because it is the highest single-digit number and contains within itself all other numbers. That's where the missing zero is. Only 9 lines up over zero. Unless you're the finest, and I, my students are the finest of the finest, bar none. Okay, they come from Microsoft. They come from the biggest general dynamics, the biggest weapons manufacturer in the world. Everybody has to come through my door if they want to be a master of their technology. What I'm about to explain is just one thing, that that nine lines up over that zero vertically, but no other number lines up over anything else vertically. Everything else lines up horizontally, except nothing lines up with the zero either. So this is the relationship of how nothing creates everything, how the universe was brought into being. So I claim to know the secret of the 3, 6, and 9. And that's a family number group. But when I'm using it, it's palindrome 3, 9, 6. 9 always comes in the middle of 3 and 6. 3 and 6 are always on the outside. And DNA follows this pattern. And if you can follow, 3 and 6 is magnetic. 9 is spirit. They're inseparable. Only magnetic fields can respond fast enough to give slippage and free play to, the, to spirit. And when spirit's going forward, the magnetic fields are going in the reverse direction. But... I had this when I was a teenager. I did not know that the 396 was that red dotted line. I, when I had that as a teenager, I didn't have it correct. I had that as a solid line. You can see how it's the same angle and the same ratio? You see this wave form in the circle? See this wave form in the circle? Because I took the most great name of God, the equation, out of the scriptures, which is the two and the five connecting to the one, because that's in Arabic is the B. That's the H is the five. I'm not using the English order of the letters. I'm using their original scriptural language. Why? Because they say the prophets deliberately revealed in those languages because they said those languages, the sound embodies the essence of what it's describing. They said it was a spiritual language. So I was, I was going by their rules. Hey, I'm not a prophet. I'm an adherent. I'm trying to learn what they're teaching, okay? I'm just trying to reverse engineer and look for the clues. Marco believes that nine is a symbol of the original source of all creation and represents the purest form of cosmic energy. He claims that the number nine holds the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe and that by understanding the mathematical properties of nine, one can harness the limitless power of the cosmos. According to Marco, all the energy in the universe comes from the singularity at the center of the vortex which is represented by the number zero. In contrast, the number nine is considered to be the symbol of the highest level of consciousness and represents a connection to the ultimate source of cosmic energy. It is a symbolic representation of the cosmic energy that emanates from the central singularity. Nikola Tesla, the famous inventor and physicist, also had a special fascination with numbers and their relationship to the universe. Tesla believed that the numbers three, six, and nine held a unique and universal significance, and he often talked about the importance of understanding the hidden patterns and symmetries in the universe. Tesla believed that if people could understand the significance of three, six, and nine and their relationship to each other, they could unlock the secrets of the universe and access limitless energy. He is famously quoted as saying, if you only knew the magnificence of the three, six, and nine, then you would have the key to the universe. Tesla believed that these numbers represented a fundamental aspect of the universe and that they contained a hidden power and symmetry that could be harnessed for great benefit. Which leads one to ask the question, just what is the connection between Tesla and Marco Rodin? Could that connection be ancient knowledge? There are several interviews and articles that have contributed to the idea that Tesla was interested in the technology of the ancient civilizations one such interview is recorded in an article titled Tesla on Ancient Knowledge and the Pyramids by Arthur H. Matthews, 
which was published in Collier's Magazine on February 9, 1929. In the interview, Tesla states, It is true that I have devoted much time to the study of the ancient records relating to civilizations that have passed away, and it has been a source of much gratification to me to find, among other achievements of genius, that of the electrical transmission of energy, to mention only one of the many discoveries which are wedded in my mind to the lore of the ages. He continued, I have never ceased to hold a strong interest in the natural sciences, and my use of the term natural applies to such phenomena and forces as are unexplainable, in terms of the accepted theories of the present-day schoolmasters. In other words, while I have devoted a goodly portion of my life to technology, the underlying theme of my studies has been spiritual. Modern science, admittedly, a mere branch of knowledge is progressing slowly on two different. The sentence suddenly cuts off. Just what was Tesla describing in this interview? What were those two different paths he was talking about? Could those two paths actually have been related to the conflicts of interest regarding capitalist tendencies in academia? We already know that Tesla's perspective on capitalism was complex and at times confrontational. He recognized the need for funding and investment but warned that the pursuit of profit in science could be a conflict of interest. He believed that the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of profit were two separate branches that should not be combined, yet industrial monopolies had seized control, stifling competition and innovation. The question remained, was capitalism the best system for scientific advancement, or was it ultimately a destructive force? As Tesla aimed to provide unlimited energy for free through his wireless energy transmission experiment, he hoped to challenge the status quo and pave the way for a new society. Indeed, Tesla's unique perspective on science and capitalism has continued to inspire thinkers and inventors in the years since his death. Among those is Marco Rodin who seeks to replicate the divine proportions Tesla believed were present throughout the universe. And those divine proportions are the fingerprint of God. We really appreciate you for tuning into this episode of Divine Science. If you are enjoying your time here on the channel, please drop a like on the video and subscribe for more revolutionary content. Now grab your popcorn and let's get back to the show. Dare to challenge the limits of conventional wisdom here on Beneficence TV. For 50 years, Malcolm has been developing his plasmoid unification model. He has been traveling outside of his homeland of Australia for 20 years just to find the sources of information he required to complete his theory, from the deserts of Egypt to the libraries throughout Europe and in America. Malcolm even searched the Vatican Library. What he found was evidence of lost knowledge of advanced technology. Knowledge hidden in plain sight. This lost technology was based around the principles of sacred geometry. Sacred geometry is the study of geometric patterns and shapes that are believed to hold spiritual and mathematical significance, often used in art, architecture, and spiritual practices. And here we have what I refer to as the alphabet of sacred geometry, and these are the simplest forms. These intricate and harmonious geometrical patterns are ubiquitously found in nature, symbolizing the interconnection and inherent order of the universe inspiring awe and reverence for the natural world. To understand why nature takes these shapes is to understand creation itself. Again, notice, everything adds up to nine for some strange reason. So how did this deeply important and sacred knowledge get lost in the first place? You can thank colonization for that. The colonization of ancient worlds discarded much of those ancient civilizations' history. Malcolm himself, comes from the lineage of a lost civilization. The civilization of Tasmania in which Europeans wiped out a whole indigenous race. No records, nothing. Wiped out due to the politics of claiming nations on the basis that they were uninhabited. As Malcolm puts it, Troy was a myth because no one had found it. For years, mainstream historians laughed at the idea of finding the city of Troy. Unfortunately for those that said it didn't exist, these pesky little things have a way of turning up, as I'm sure will happen with Atlantis. Humans have a strange proclivity to disregard and completely minimalize the knowledge of our ancestors. This is very naive and insulting to our ancestors and to the people who wrote the Sanskrit text. They had the same mental acuity that we have, anatomically the same, 
and the Romans with their aqueducts and city building and planning the cities out with a lot of forethought. They all have very similar blueprints within their cultures, which means there was a central government. There was a central body of knowledge that government was drawing upon. And that knowledge throughout history comes and goes like the tide. The knowledge of plasmoids has been hidden in plain sight for centuries, and societies have lost that ancient knowledge, a large part thanks to the externalities of capitalism and its tendency to exploit other countries. According to Malcolm, the plasmoid unification model offers a complex solution to the problem of unifying everything, taking into account the properties and relationships of crystal form, sound, color, time, and angles. This technology revolves around the ancient numerical patterns found in structures such as the pyramids and other architectural wonders. These numbers, when analyzed, reveal a fascinating relationship between various ancient civilizations and their architecture, as proven by pioneers like Randall Carlson. Geometry is integral to understanding the PUM, and plasmoids generate and store charge using the principles of sacred geometry. Malcolm's plasmoid diagram categorizes different aspects of the universe, aether, sun, matter, and time. When we understand the relationships between these four categories, we can begin to build a picture of how our universe actually works. Aether represents the underlying energy of our universe. It is DC energy at rest, as observed in Marco Roden's vision. The source of the non-decaying spin of an electron, zero-point fluctuations in the vacuum, Aether can best be visualized by imagining the light paradox. The light paradox refers to a situation where all colors are present, yet there are no colors observed. Imagine you have a beam of light. If you take light going into a prism, you can see that light splits up into its frequencies and contains in itself all colors. This paradox arises when light contains a mixture of all possible colors. However, due to a phenomenon called color subtraction, when all colors are mixed together in equal amounts, they cancel each other out and no colors are perceived. Instead of perceiving a mixture of colors, the result is a perceived absence of color or white light. This paradox highlights the similarities between the ether, because ether contains within it all time, matter and color, but this energy exists in a realm where there is no time, matter or colors. Still confused? I don't blame you. Let's try another analogy. Imagine you have a magic toy box that can turn out any toy you can think of. How cool would that be? Now, this toy box is a bit magical because it can make all the toys appear and disappear instantly just by thinking about it. But here's where things get tricky. Sometimes you want to have all the toys in your toy box at the same time, right? It's like having a big party with all your favorite toys. However, the magic box can only hold one toy at a time. So, you can only play with one toy while the others are waiting in line. The ether paradox is kind of like having all toys and no toys at the same time. It can be a bit confusing, just like the paradox of having nothing and everything all at once. But sometimes, these kinds of paradoxes help us think about the deeper mysteries of the universe and how everything is connected. So this is the paradox and this is what our society lost through ignoring sacred geometry by not learning the wisdom which was transmitted through ancient texts, wisdom was enshrined in, for example, the Great Pyramids so we wouldn't lose it. It makes sense. What is the one thing that would be left after a global calamity? Giant megalithic structures made out of stone. The sun acts as an intermediary between the realm of aether and the realm of matter, facilitating the flow of energy and the emergence of physical existence. The sun has the ability to imprint frequencies onto the surrounding energy called aether, transforming it into matter. It could be speculated that the interactions and movements of energy within the aether could potentially align with the recurring pattern of the 3, 6, and 9. Furthermore, in this hypothetical connection, the sun could be envisioned as a focal point or generator of energy within the aether. The energy emissions and processes associated with the sun could be seen as one manifestation of the underlying energy flow or vibration identified in the 369 pattern observed by Marco Roden. Putting on our vortex math lens, the sun can be seen as the number nine or the source of this energy at rest. Then we have time. Time is seen as the mold that shapes matter, with different dimensions, both 4D and 3D playing a role in this process. 
Malcolm makes an analogy of transitioning from the sun to matter. This transition necessitates the involvement of time as a crucial element. Malcolm explains this transition by likening it to converting direct current into alternating current, which involves adding timing or time as a factor. However, traditional methods of conversion results in a loss of energy. All matter inherently possesses frequency characteristics, with time and the sun playing important roles in shaping and transforming energy into tangible matter. Malcolm argues that since time is mutable and can be reversed or sped up, light, which travels at a constant speed, serves as a reference point for proving that matter is fundamentally based on frequency in relation to time. That's where matter comes from, the interaction of frequency and time. Aether is a concept that represents the underlying fabric or essence of the universe. It symbolizes the infinite, formless and all-pervading energy beyond physical matter. In sacred geometry, it is often associated with the concept of universal consciousness or from the unmanifested potential from which everything arises. In summary, Malcolm's plasmoid unification model posits that all matter inherently possesses frequency characteristics and time and the sun play important roles in shaping and transforming energy into tangible matter. Diving into the unification model's ancient connections starts by highlighting the number 432, which is believed to be a universal constant and resonant frequency found in various phenomena and ancient civilizations. Bendel suggests that 432 represents the number of protons or electrons required to form a plasmoid. This implies that plasmoids, which are key energy sources in the PUM, resonate at this frequency, indicating a profound connection between energy, matter, and the universe's design. Regarding Malcolm's practical application for the PUM, he calls it the Molten Sea Arc Atomic Reconstruction Technology. This type of cold fusion technology allows for atomic reactions at manageable temperatures and without any toxic byproducts. The Molten Sea Arc refers to Solomon's Molten Sea, which he believes was the last known plasmoid generator used in history for storing and generating electrical charges. Unlike its well-known counterpart, the Ark of the Covenant, the Molten Sea Ark was a massive basin, described as being 10 cubits in diameter, 5 cubits in height, and having a decorative rim in the form of flower petals. It rested on 12 bronze oxen, three facing each cardinal direction. This would have made the diameter about 15 feet. The connection between the Molten Sea Ark and the Ark of the Covenant is not direct, as historically they served different purposes in Solomon's Temple. The Ark of the Covenant was a sacred chest that contained the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments and was seen as the symbolic presence of God. It was placed in the innermost part of the temple known as the Holy of Holies, while historically the Molten Sea Basin was placed in the outer courtyard. Malcolm believes that same technology behind the phenomenon known as MSART was utilized in the Molten Sea Ark. Plasmoids are atomic batteries that store energy through their specific geometric shapes. He believes that, based on the descriptions of the Ark, they were utilizing sacred geometric principles to produce free energy. Malcolm suggests that plasmoids generated through an imploded bubble are safe and can be used to store massive amounts of energy. It is estimated that up to one kilowatt of power can be stored within clusters of plasmoids that reach their maximum charge density. These plasmoids can effectively store and discharge energy in a controlled manner. His theory also suggests that the Molten Sea acted as the charger for these plasmoids and the Ark of the Covenant was a capacitor that had the ability to hold those plasmoids. This is why it's called the Molten Sea, an entire sea of energy within one 10 cubit basin. It utilizes water in the same way Malcolm's generator does, as fuel. Bendel also mentions the importance of the numbers 27 and 9 in relation to the Sun, Moon, and Earth. He suggests that the sun and moon exhibit a harmonic resonance with the Earth based on these numbers. The Earth's mean orbital radius is approximately 27 times the moon's mean orbital radius, and the Earth's mean rotation period is approximately 27 times the moon's mean orbital period. The number 9 appears because 27 is divisible by 9, highlighting a harmonious relationship between these celestial bodies these numerical relationships proposed by Bendel 
aimed to demonstrate the intricate and intelligent design present in the universe and its connection to the plasmoid unification model. By exploring the numerical patterns and relationships, Malcolm seeks to gain a deeper understanding of the fundamental principles that govern energy, matter, and creation. Applying this model, Malcolm has invented a combustible engine retrofit that will not only double efficiency, but eliminate toxic waste gases by turning exhaust into oxygen. With a traditional combustion engine, you produce toxins and byproducts, which create a positive charge simply because they are explosive rather than implosive. Explosive force is death and destruction. The main goal of the PUM is to transition existing explosive and destructive technologies into plasmoid tech, which is seen as an intro to the new industrial revolution. Moving away from explosive technologies towards implosive intelligent ones. Malcolm warns us that explosive technologies are primitive and that implosive technologies are intelligent. Implosive technologies are the hallmark of enlightened societies, which states we need to get away from destroying the planet. If you think about the UFO connection for a moment, these craft obviously don't utilize explosive propulsion. It has been theorized that UFOs most likely use some kind of field propulsion and that this gives a scientific explanation for some of those unexplained phenomena. Plasma does seem to show inertial dampening properties as well, and Malcolm himself emphasizes that the ultimate application of plasmoids, while they can be used almost anywhere in industry, they can be utilized most effectively in space. It's an infinite source of energy, which is matter, and you can travel speeds exceeding the speed of light. Because light is not a constant, he claims his technology has the ability to alter the speed of light. That's what we call a warp drive. The plasmoid unification model and vortex-based math share some similarities as they both relate to the fundamental principles of creation and the relationships between elements. Both models recognize that everything in the universe is based on geometry and that there are certain constant numbers that underlie creation. Vortex-based math focuses on the numerical patterns that emerge from the torus and spiral configurations found throughout nature. While the plasmoid unification model focuses on the resonant frequencies of life's elements critical to mankind's existence and development, both models recognize the interconnectedness of all things and the importance of understanding the geometry that underlies creation. The plasmoid unification model posits that plasmoids embody all sacred geometry, which is fundamental to their atomic battery capabilities. Vortex-based math is also based on the geometry of the torus which is seen as the fundamental shape of the universe, the path of least resistance for free-flowing energy. Both models show that the universe is an intelligent design, and that design is in perfect harmony with itself and resonates in unison with a collective chord. This is the key to understanding the energy and matter conversion mechanisms underlying creation itself. Each model individually gives us evidence of divine creation, the fingerprint of God. Together, they create a comprehensible model for understanding the very fundamentals of our reality. A hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy that can show you everything and nothing all at the same time. Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid unification model is a theoretical model that posits that there is a fundamental unity underlying all matter and energy, which he calls a plasmoid or a protoverse. According to the plasmoid model, these plasmoid structures make up the very fabric of reality, existing at all scales from subatomic particles to supernovas and galactic clusters. They are thought to have a range of properties, including resonant frequencies that correspond to specific shapes, colors, cardinal directions, and other physical phenomena. Furthermore, the plasmoid model suggests that plasmoids are responsible for many of the observable phenomena in the universe, from the rotation of galaxies to the behavior of particles in accelerators. The theory also proposes that plasmoids can serve as a unifying framework that can explain phenomena across disparate fields, from astrophysics to chemistry and biology. In essence, the plasmoid unification model promises to provide a comprehensive explanation for the behavior of matter and energy across the universe, potentially revolutionizing our understanding of physics and cosmology. Nevertheless, the model is still in the early stages of development, and requires more research to fully comprehend its implications. It begins with the plasmoid generator, a device that is designed to produce plasmoids artificially. 
It works by using ultraviolet light to ionize gas, and combined with the vacuum phase of the engine, creates microbubbles in a chamber of water. These microbubbles, when compressed on the piston's power stroke phase, symmetrically implode, which happens so violently and with such force, it actually changes their state of matter from liquid to gas and then to a plasma. First it expands, then it collapses. And this collapse happens so violently that vapor molecules trapped inside the bubble slam together and heat up so much that the bubble gives off an incredible burst of heat and light several thousand times a second, giving the appearance of a star. This plasma is then shaped by a magnetic field which is self-sustaining due to its toroidal geometry. The resulting plasmoid can also be given a specific resonant frequency and other properties to suit a particular application, such as fusion energy research. These plasmoids are what Stan Meyer's water-powered car was running on, a cold fission reaction that disassociates the water molecules into their base components of oxygen and hydrogen. When these plasmoids discharge using their maximum charge density, they can release up to one kilowatt of power. They accomplish this by actually tapping into zero-point energy. Remember what we talked about before regarding vortex math and the zero-point. Now, if you, I'm really roughhousing you guys. I play hard, and that's called having fun. If you don't have a funnel, you're not having fun, okay? And that's called a vortex well. If You're not healthy if you don't have that well. So all the most affirmative positive words in our language are all based on the vortex. Did I and push that too hard at that point, or is it obvious that that's true? The center of the toroid is the only place you can access the zero-point energy field, how you tap into nature's unlimited supply of clean energy. For the Bendel engine retrofit, they are utilized in the same way that nature utilizes counter-rotating vortexes colliding at specific angles. Once the plasmoids are generated, they are then sucked up into the thunderstorm generator during the piston's vacuum phase, the thunderstorm generator is a tube with a sphere attached, which contains multiple spheres of specific ratios. These spheres utilize sacred geometric principles. The ice-cold plasmoids and burning hot exhaust collide at just the right angle to produce a cold atomic reaction. Once the plasmoids interact with the electric fields generated by the separation of charges inside the generator, it can cause the plasmoid to destabilize and collapse, releasing large amounts of energy in the form of sound, light, and electromagnetic radiation. A thunderstorm in a bottle. A thunderclap is an enormous and sudden release of electrical energy from a bolt of lightning. A large bolt of lightning can contain up to 1 billion joules of energy, which is equivalent to the energy in about 300,000 AA batteries. So where does all this energy come from? Tesla once famously said, Electric power is everywhere present in unlimited quantities. I can drive the world's machinery without the need of coal, oil, gas, or any other fuel. This new power for the driving of the world's machinery will be derived from the energy which operates the universe, the cosmic energy. It is highly suspected that nature's thunderclap gets its energy from this same process that Bendel uses. The process of tapping into zero-point energy via the use of microscopic toroidal-shaped bits of ball lightning. And we can see nature clearly utilizing this cosmic energy. So how is Mother Nature accessing it? The plasmoid clusters can disassociate the hydrogen into harmless oxygen and hydrogen, which can then be fed back into the engine via a cold fusion process that had previously been suppressed during the replication of the pons fleischmann experiment. Although the secret behind these energy clusters have been studied by many scientists, upon further research, it was discovered by Malcolm that these clusters were nothing new and simply the phenomenon of static electricity, a secret that has eluded scientists for centuries, a remarkable discovery hidden in plain sight. But as the world awaits further evidence and experimentation to confirm or refute the plasmoid unification model's bold predictions, some scientists are left wondering. Could this theory truly be the holy grail of physics? However, the dramatic unfolding of events last month 
has finally provided the long-awaited verification for Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid unification model, stunning and silencing the doubters who had dismissed it as mere speculation and confirming that this trailblazing theory may indeed be the key to unlocking the mysteries of the universe. Malcolm Bendel is a man shrouded in mystery, known only by his thunderstorm generator and fleeting glimpses of his public appearances. Little is known about his personal life, but rumors abound of a reclusive genius who spends his days locked away in a hidden laboratory, obsessively tinkering with complex equations and calculations to solve the mysteries of the cosmos. Bendel's groundbreaking theories have astounded the scientific community and defied all expectations, leading many to speculate that he possesses an unparalleled intellect and an innate instinct for the inner workings of the cosmos. Yet his unbridled genius has also attracted controversy and scrutiny, with some in the field accusing him of being a charlatan and a fraud. These baseless accusations are nothing new, recycled from an old smear campaign from a greedy oil company who bribed journalists and politicians to ruin his reputation so that they may scare off his oil investors. A controversial topic that should have been discussed, then dismissed on the Joe Rogan experience, However, according to Randall Carlson, who was on the podcast with Malcolm, Joe was obsessively concerned with Malcolm's past and focused very little on the actual groundbreaking technology. Regardless of Malcolm's past, it is irresponsible for Joe to not have released this podcast, especially since, according to Randall, Joe agreed to verify it before releasing it. The engine has been verified, and it is time for Joe Rogan to do his part to spread the word about this amazing technology. We must demand that Joe release that episode of his podcast. It's important to be aware of potential misinformation or exaggerations that can occur when discussing new technologies and scientific breakthroughs. While the Roden coil and other electromagnetic devices may have certain advantages in terms of energy efficiency and performance, there is currently no scientific evidence to support the claim that they have any significant healing properties and Roden himself dismisses such claims. And again, so just the existing Roden coil technology already gets rid of the weight problem in, in motors and coils. I believe it can be printed as a circuit. I think it should be made out of plasma. I believe I can make a spaceship out of that. I believe I can use that to, um, not as a radionic device, so they've done tens of millions of dollars of sales as that to treat and heal people for, for deadly diseases. I don't espouse that. I don't teach that. I don't promote that. That's what other people have done independent of me. What I believe is that you can do gene splicing with it. There is, however, a specific design for the rodent coil that utilizes torsion physics. As we've talked about before, torsion physics is one area of study that is promising for major scientific breakthroughs in energy. The Nunez design, as I like to call it, was the design of Daniel and Erica Nunez of One Stop Energies a promising startup that was actively helping the community to study, understand, and develop this technology for the advancement of the world. It saddens me to say that without any indication of why, both the Nunes's and the dozens of video tutorials and demonstrations they had up on YouTube were all suddenly taken down, and the couple has not been heard from since 2022, where they posted their last Facebook message. The couple, who had been active on YouTube and Facebook for quite some time, were in the process of obtaining a lease for a building in New York to expand their experiments and contributions to society. Their take on the rodent coil is one that I have not seen elsewhere. It uses the same geometry as Marco Rodin's traditional coil, only this coil utilizes two counter-rotating vortexes by introducing a second, phase-shifted channel of wires. These two equal but opposing channels when synchronized and pumped with enough voltage will supposedly amplify and produce tiny amounts of overunity by tapping into zero-point energy. If the effects of their coil design are true, then I suspect that when enough voltage is put through the coil and two counter-rotating electromagnetic fields are produced, tiny amounts of plasmoid clusters might be produced at the zero point of the coil the center where implosion and explosion meet, what Marco says is a gateway to zero-point energy. Erica Nunez notoriously demonstrated their coil design by hooking a simple amplifier up to the coil. The amplifier fed the coil with less than one watt of energy, 
yet the coil was able to power a full 192 LED panel. Conventional science says this should be impossible. Could their unconventional and ingenious way of introducing torsion physics into the rodent coil design really be the secret to unlocking the potential of vortex energy? It is important to note that the significance of torsion physics is not a new concept. The ancient Indian texts mentioning vimanas, which are flying machines that allegedly use counter-rotation of accelerated mercury, hint at a profound understanding of energy manipulation that has been lost in time. The Sanskrit texts of the Hindu and Buddhist tradition talk about incredible flying craft called vimana. We already know that when an electric current is introduced into mercury, it accelerates the mercury in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction, depending on the polarity of the electricity. Many of the Sanskrit texts on Vimanas speak of using mercury as part of their propulsion. And this would be exactly what NASA is planning to use right now. An ion thruster type spacecraft, which is using solar energy to charge mercury particles that are discharged from the back of the craft, giving it thrust and propelling it into space. As we've heard in his interview with Collier magazine on ancient knowledge and the pyramids, we know for a fact that Tesla himself believed ancient cultures had the ability to transmit electricity wirelessly, an astounding claim that largely gets dismissed in mainstream science a trend that is hopefully changing with the new unbiased evidence brought on by independent thinkers like Graham Hancock and Ben Van Kirkwick. Today, modern scientists continue to explore the potential applications of torsion physics, opening up possibilities for advancements in energy generation and beyond. By applying vortex math concepts to coil designs, researchers have developed electromagnetic waveguides that more efficiently guide and manipulate electromagnetic waves. These waveguides find applications in communication technologies such as antennas, satellite communication, and radar systems. There have already been several major breakthroughs in technology regarding patents based off of Marco's vortex math and unified theory. Some of those include resonant inductive coupling. This technology, based on the principles of resonant magnetic induction, utilizes special coil designs to wirelessly transfer power between two coils by creating high-frequency oscillating magnetic fields. By applying the concepts of vortex math, researchers have developed more efficient and reliable resonant inductive coupling systems for applications such as wireless charging of electronic devices and electric vehicle charging. Using the principles of vortex math and the various rodent coil designs, advancements have been made in the development of highly sensitive and accurate magnetic field sensors. These sensors can detect and measure magnetic fields in various applications, such as navigation systems, industrial automation, and scientific research. Inspired by the principles of vortex math, Inventors have developed energy harvesting devices that utilize enhanced coil designs to capture and convert ambient energy, such as vibrations, electromagnetic fields, and thermal gradients, into usable electrical power. These devices have potential applications in self-powered wireless sensors, IoT devices, and renewable energy systems. Looking back at Vortex Math and the secret to 3, 6, and 9, which Marco says represents an electromagnetic flux field, that is at the center of reality. He suggests that this magnetic flux field formed by these numbers is at the core of all existence. The interaction of this flux field is what makes our reality physical. This could imply that electromagnetism is more significant than gravity when trying to understand the universe. Could the universe really be governed by electromagnetism? And these patterns don't just apply to base 10. They translate into all base form constructs due to these principles being a part of our universe's intelligent design. Sometimes it's easier to grasp the more complex ideas of vortex math by thinking about them in reverse. Sort of like how reducing vortexes down to lower dimensions turns a spiral into a curve as you've seen earlier. By shifting your perspective, a different angle of enlightenment can be observed. After all, simplicity is beauty for a reason. And there really is no point to having the secrets of the universe if they can only be understood by an esoteric few. Richard Feynman was known for his charismatic personality and knack for explaining complex scientific concepts to broader audiences. That's what we try to do on Divine Science, 
we boil things down into easily digestible and easily understood concepts so that everyone can unlock their unlimited potential and we can all pave a brighter future. Together, despite Marco's rightfully enormous claims, he never really figured out how to accurately apply the math to the three-dimensional toroid for practical uses. Because VBM is so difficult and unusual to understand, very few people have attempted it, and even those who do are rarely capable of the task. Nevertheless, Marco continues to teach and pursue his understanding of VBM, while a select few take up the challenge of cataloging and publicizing his work. There have been some very highly credentialed mathematicians completely bungle, explaining the basics of VBM. A number of people seemingly have understood VBM and applied it, but have continued on to keep it private and use it for their own projects rather than open sourcing. Marco did manage to get noticed by a lot of rather large and scary companies at times, but he has turned down pretty much any offer anyone has ever given him. Instead, he continues to teach a small group of very serious students who are working towards cataloging and publicizing his work, while he continues to pursue his own deeper understanding of VBM. Looking back at Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid unification model, he too had theorized that all elements are plasmoids, which is also a type of torus-shaped vortex. Suddenly, the bigger picture is coming together. That picture is a polarized programming language that is used for creation. A programming language that when observed will show you the fingerprint of God. So, just how did Malcolm come to this remarkable and revolutionary discovery? Could it be that, while mainstream science has a bias toward anything spiritual, they immediately label it pseudoscience? Could the secrets of the universe really be unlocked by combining the objective lens of science with the subjective experience of religion? Yin and Yang. Science and spirituality. Divine science. Something we see reflected in history through our ancestors. Ancient knowledge, lost in time. With so many discoveries happening, there is still so much we don't understand. It seems one thing is true, something that has always been true. The only constant is change. And the more we see, the less we know, for sure. This has been a Beneficence TV original, and I'm the Benefactor. Stay tuned for more episodes on zero-point energy, anti-gravitics, and other forms of forbidden knowledge. Many thanks to the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, Jordan from Alchemical Science and their amazing online communities, without which this show would not be possible. If you like our content, please consider subscribing to our YouTube and TikTok channels. We also have a new online forum with do-it-yourself guides where the community can share their ideas and post questions. A one-stop shop for knowledge. Right here at BeneficenceTV.com.